Again, good to, to see you, good to, to sing with you. Thank you, um, worship team. Thank you uh, for tech team, all that you do to kind of make this possible. And uh, um, so I wanted to ask you this morning, are you feeling kind of blah this morning? Besides the singing, besides, are you feeling kind of blah? Well, and I, I'm not just talking about the Packer loss either. <laughs> Um, statistics and all kinds of uh, history um, show us that this time of year can be the worst uh, for many of us. Approximately three weeks pass into the new year. Um, many people feel blah and it's just a hard time and there are reasons for that. Um, it's still really cold here in the northern part of the northern hemisphere. It's dark, the days are short, and so the combination of the cold, the darkness, um, but then also um, holiday debt comes due about this time. If you spent a lot of money in, in November and December in order to spruce up and to make the holidays a big deal, it, it comes due right about this time. And that can be something that kind of weighs heavy. Um, also resolutions, New Year's resolutions, things that we want to do, you know, good intentions, how we want to change and do things better. Often about three weeks into the new year is when we've failed in many of our resolutions and they can be discouraging. And these four things in different combinations for all of us can lead to just kind of a heaviness, a blah. And I was reminded this week as I was thinking about this uh, years ago when I was a young person in my family, uh, my parents had friends that identified this thing and they decided to do something about it. And so they initiated and then hosted an annual anti blahs party sometime between the 20th of January to the end of January as a way to get people together to try and um, encourage people and get through that. Um, now, hosting a party or gathering may not be your thing and um, or it may not even be advisable depending on you know what's going on in your household and with COVID and stuff like that but there are many things that we can do as believers as followers of Jesus Christ as believers in the God who sees the God who cares the God who knows and the God who loves and can make a difference there are things that we can do and number one on the list the starting point again not just in late January that all throughout the year is to remember. You know, I'm going to give us three quick reminders. To remember, number one, that we and other human beings are not arbitrary. You are not arbitrary. The people around you are not arbitrary. And you're not a commodity. You're not a mere number on some spreadsheet of some kind. Every human being, every human being, is so much bigger than that. The scriptures declare that every human being is purposed by God in love and is uniquely beautiful and significant, not perfect, struggling with our own failings and, and, and selfishnesses, but uniquely beautiful and with all kinds of potential. And that God values every person, you and the people around you, with a pursuing and unshakable love that never, never stops. And that God's grace is always available to us, uniquely revealed in Jesus. We need to remember this about ourselves and what God says about us and what Jesus has proven and demonstrated. Second, besides just remembering and getting our brains and our hearts centered on that, which is a tremendous launching point for any activity in life, Believing what God says is true about ourselves and others. We need to then extend beyond that and to recognize and appreciate the beauty and the significance of the people around us. In our families, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, in our interest groups. All the different persons to be able to recognize people's unique value, beauty, and their difference. And that you and I get to share life with people who are different than us in all kinds of different spheres. We get to share relationship. And we get to share responsibility with people who are not just like us. And that's a good thing. Because people who are different than us have strengths that we don't have. 
People who are different than us can benefit from our strengths, and we can shore and build one another up. Again, at work, in our homes, in places of worship, in the community. So again, remember that you and others are not arbitrary, not by a long shot, and not commodities or mere numbers. Appreciate the differences and the different strengths and abilities and, of others. And then to encourage others. And this is so important. Again, not just in late January, but to encourage others by being engaged and by being fully present with others to let them know that they are worthy of your attention because you listen. Because you ask clarifying questions, because you take an interest in what's important to them, and you share life, not just using interaction, be it face-to-face, -face, be it over social media, as just a way to self-promote and get an audience for yourself, but to actually interact and listen and connect with others. If we do these things, prompted by the understanding of who God has made us and every person to be in His love, it becomes an amazing launching pad to overcome all manner of, for lack of a better word, blahs that can get a hold of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. At the core of that is the love of God in Christ that is the difference maker. And that's the foundation as we are continuing our new series in the book of Exodus. Make a world of difference. God wants every person as individuals and working together. We can make a world of difference. That was God's intention from the very beginning when he made his outlandish promise to Abraham and to Sarah who had been married a long time and were completely child, childless and that was a very big hardship back then in particular and said, all nations of the earth all peoples will be blessed through you. And your descendants will become as multiple. Look at the stars. Your descendants will be numerous and will be lights to the world like the stars are. A man and woman who were childless. And he made this promise to Abraham and his descendants. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And toward the end of Genesis we've been looking at Joseph. Joseph. And now God, at the end of Genesis, took that family, that Jacob's family, who Joseph had been estranged from, brought them into the, into the nation of Israel at a key and critical junction in history. And then Exodus goes forward in God's plan of making a world of difference through a people that have faith and trust and will depend on him to lead them forward. And that has huge implications for us today, right now. So let's pray and get into the details of the message. Lord, thank you again for your everlasting love. Thank you that you are the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all, the one who dwells in all time, the one who dwells in all space, the one who has an everlasting, pursuing love for every person. And that's proven and demonstrated incredibly in Jesus Christ in his incarnation, in his crucifixion, and in his resurrection. Lord, thank you that you desire us all to experience a relationship of love and power and difference-making because of you within us. So, Lord, we're out here on a cold morning. We got some unexpected snow. Many of us are smarting from a packer loss or other more significant difficulties in our lives. Lord, thank you that you're fully capable to meet us exactly where we're at. You've been doing that throughout history. And every person is significant and all that's going on is significant to you. So Lord, we ask that you would meet us where we're at by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we're going to be looking into your living and active word, inspired by the Spirit, which for generations and millennia and people across all cultures, you have been inspiring and bringing life to every person. Lord, we need that. Remind us of your commitment of love to us. Remind us of who we are and who you would like us to be and how you can help us be. Thank you, Lord, that this is all possible because, again, 
You are the living act of God. So speak through me, speak to me, bless, encourage, and challenge us all that when we leave this place, we'll be better equipped to be passionate lovers of you and passionate lovers and servers of others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. So again, our series, just a reminder about making a world of difference in the book of Exodus. And as I mentioned, God is committed to touching the lives of human beings as individuals and groups and then leading them forward to make a world of difference. And we start right where we're at. And so following up from last week, um, we just kind of a, a touch point. The focus th today is about find God aligned with the vulnerable. Last week was about um, you know, what to do and staying true or standing firm when the ground shifts from under us. And that happened in history through God's people in Egypt when Joseph helped save Egypt and helped them prepare for a seven-year famine by storing grain for seven years. And it made a huge transformational difference in Egypt and in the region. And the pharaohs of Egypt, though Joseph had been a slave in Egypt, though Joseph was a foreigner and was he of Hebrew origin, they so saw the wisdom and expertise of God that helped them as a nation that he maintained significant status and significant influence in Egypt because he and God had used him to be such a blessing to the people. And that's when his family came, that Joseph sent for his family to be come to Egypt, and they were in Egypt through the last five years of the famine, and then when the famine ended, they continued to dwell in Egypt. And again, remember, Pharaoh was so happy with Joseph, and so delighted to have Joseph's family and descendants come, they put them in the region of Goshen, a region of near the Nile Delta in the north that flowed into the Mediterranean. And it was a very well-watered region, so crops could be grown, plants could grow, that animals and sheep herders, which is what Jacob's family was, would do well. And they prospered and flourished there for a long time. And if it shows up behind me, just as a reminder, Joseph came to Egypt, or was brought to Egypt, to become a slave approximately 1915 B.C. And he was there all the way through 1805. Again, he lived 110 years. While Joseph was approximately 39, that's when his father, Jacob, the Israelites, came to Goshen and settled there at the invitation of the Pharaoh, again, because Joseph had done so well, and they dwelt there in Goshen from 1876 B.C. to approximately 1730. And they flourished during that period of time. The scriptures talk about how they became exceedingly numerous and multiplied and filled the entire region. And undoubtedly, they were valued trading partners, though they were within the nation of Egypt. They were kept separate, but clearly the, the meat and stuff that they raised from their goats and the sheep, the wool, the milk and the cheese, all that kind of stuff was a big benefit to Egypt. And so they were highly regarded up until about 1730. And that's when a new regime, if you want to call it, a new family, if you will, took over the pharaoh leadership of Egypt, called the Hyksos family, or the Hyksos. And from approximately 1730 to 1446, the Hyksos pharaohs began to change things. They didn't have the connections with Joseph's positive impact on Egypt. And so over time, things began to change. And in the first approximately 146 years, from the time the Israelites were in Goshen, things were, pro were, things were positive, but things began to change. And they began to oppress the Israelites, as we talked about last week, enslaving them. You know, they had been free within the nation, in the region of Goshen, for more than 100 years, almost 200 years. But the scriptures, as we saw last week, the decision was made by the new leadership of the Hyksos pharaohs to oppress, to enslave, and the scripture said they worked them and they used them ruthlessly in hard and exploita exploitative labor, and they denigrated them and they marginalized them. 
those who'd been their strategic partner. Last week, as we finished up in chapter 1 of Exodus, this king became so ruthless and so obsessed with keeping control of the Israelites within his nation that he basically made two orders in order to control the population of the Israelites. And his orders were, first of all, to the Hebrew midwives that helped in the births. And the leadership of that said, you know what, what, you, what I'm ordering you do, to do, and I'm the king, is to kill the Hebrew boy babies as soon as they're born. If girls are coming out, no problem. But when boys are coming out, you are to kill them. But they ignored him because they feared God. When that didn't work, when they did not comply, he gave a new order, and this is how we finished last week, is that he made an order to all Egyptians and said, Hebrew boys that are just born or of a certain age, they need to be thrown into the Nile River to get rid of them. We need to control these people. We've, we're oppressing them as slaves. We have slave masters. Now we're going to go further into their families and have the boys, you have authority as citizens of Egypt, to go in there and throw the boys into the Nile. And that's where we begin in Exodus 2. Not a good situation. Not a good situation at all. Follow along with me as we read in Exodus chapter 2, the first 10 verses. So I'll, I'll read it out loud. You can follow on the screen or just listen, whatever works best for you. But then we'll kind of go back and unpack it and get into some more details. A married, verse 1, a married Levite woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Again, remember, there's the order that boys... Hebrew boys are to be killed upon birth. She saw he was a fine child, and she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, and she coated it with tar and pitch on the outsides to make it watertight. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. Then she placed the child in it and put it among... Oh, I just, I just read, re sorry. I get worked up. It's exciting. The baby's in a basket, a papyrus basket in the reeds along the side of the Nile River. His sister stood at a distance, obviously an older sister. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby inside, and he was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then the baby's sister, who'd been keeping watch, asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Again, the baby is young of age, only a few months old. She saw the reaction that she was compassionate. Oh, this is one of the Hebrew. Shall I get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, go. And the girl went and got the baby's actual mother, her mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman did. Again, the woman being the baby's original mother. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Wow. It's a lot there. Put yourself in the position of being a mother or a parent. And when a child comes into the world, it's a wonderful, delightful, exciting time. But in this case, it's an extremely fearful time because you live under the oppression of a government that is willing to have your child or insist that your child be killed if it's a boy when it comes into the world. Imagine living under that dread that pressure, that foreboding. That's what's going on here. Now, 
In other places in Scripture, the Levite woman has a name. Her name is Yoshebed. She's married to a Levite man. They're from the tribe and the family of Levi. They have a daughter, Lydia, which is mentioned here. They also have a young, another son who is mentioned later that will appear later in Exodus. How? At some point, they kept, they kept the birth a secret from officials and prying eyes on but at some point it wasn't possible anymore and they took this very risky, unusual gamble and put the baby in a basket, a floating basket in reeds, but kept an eye on it. The scripture doesn't give us more details about why they put it there, if they knew that the Pharaoh household, would you bathe down here at times? We don't have those details. What's significant and most important here is that this mother, under deep pressure and deep distress, took a risk, took a step of faith, we don't know all that was behind it, in order to protect her child. And God honored it. It's also worthy of note, you know, the leadership in Egypt, the Hyksos pharaohs, and again, there were you know, several generations of them. This one was probably one called Tutmos III during this time period, and history shows us this. He decided to exploit the Hebrews. He decided to enslave them and to work them ruthlessly in order to consolidate control for himself and his nation. He is the one that said, midwives, kill the babies. He's the one that told his people. It's really interesting that this powerful king, Pharaoh, was thwarted by a series of women. Yeah, you heard me say it. He was thwarted in his plans by a series of women that were trusting of God, compassionate. First of all, the scriptures say, the midwives refused to do what he ordered them, probably under, un, most certainly under penalty of death, because they feared God. Then, the baby's mother Not powerful at all by comparison. Hid him as long as she could, and then took a step in order to protect him in a way that, again, we don't know all the details behind it. God honored him. His sister kept watch to make sure that the baby was going to be okay or to keep track of what was going on. Another woman. The midwives, his mother, his older sister, and then... The very Pharaoh's daughter, who had made this ruthless attempt to squelch and to crush these people in these individual babies' lives. And his sister, by God's grace and God's providence, her sister, his daughter is provoked to feel compassion. This is one of the Hebrew babies. Oh, History tells us a little more that she may have been without a child. And we don't want to go into all the details of that. Women, faithful, compassionate women thwarted this oppressive act and series of actions and orders by this Pharaoh. What's the takeaway for us today? It's important for us to remember that God uses and God will use our faith and our courage to protect those who are at risk. You remember I mentioned that the message title today, if you want, is called Find God. Find God with the vulnerable. You want to find God in your life? You'll find him and see him looking out for him, being concerned and doing something about the causes of the vulnerable. You want to find God? Get involved in being concerned about those who are vulnerable in your midst. And here we see God is aware of what's going on with the vulnerable here. 
And he uses our faith. And he uses our courage to protect, to preserve, to uplift the cause of those who are at risk or vulnerable. Does that make sense? See, we live in a culture that often encourages us to network with those that can help us exclusively or to increase our power or to build our brand. And there are certain aspects of that are necessary, but if that becomes part of who we are in a competitive, fast-moving society, we lose concern, we lose connection, we lose interest at all with those that in our estimation don't have a lot to offer us or we're walking away, we're drifting away from the very heart of God. It's important that we remember that God uses our faith and our courage to protect and to uplift those at risk. And I mentioned the women in faith, in compassion, in regarding human beings as having dignity and value, thwarted the oppressor. So can we. I was reminded of this, uh, I hope I don't lose it here. I was reminded of this within the last couple of months, having a conversation with a friend in, in a business situation and mentioned that um, some issues regarding, you know, our, the, the company or the, the whatever that we're, you know, has a, you know, he's, I'm concerned that the company that I work for is um, insisting on payment from those who are subcontractors in a short amount of time, within 30 days, but we drag our feet in actually paying those that we owe money to our lesser subcontractors. And I remember hearing that, and it really brought back a really bad memory. In my working life before, many years ago, I remember sitting in a conference room with about 10 people. It was being told of a rollout, and the, and the circumstances at the time were that you know many of the dot-com companies were really being super profitable, and in order to get money from the, in the stock market, you really needed to demonstrate a 30%, a 40% return per year. Otherwise, money was going to other places, and there was just this, we really, really need to be more efficient. And it was... Something's been rolled out on high, and this is going to help us. Okay, what is it? We're going to demand payment to us within 30 days on those that are lesser and smaller than us, our subcontractors that, that, are, less, that are, are not as powerful, not as big as we are. But we will drag our foot. We're not going to pay anything for 90 days. And that float, that spread of 60 days... That, or corporate-wide, is going to make us a lot of money. And I remember just being incensed. Because we talked about strategic partners and all this kind of stuff, yet we were exploiting and putting undue pressure on those that were, in a sense, powerless. And the question was asked by me and a few others. Well, you know, they're not going to like this. This isn't fair. They don't have a choice. This is what we're doing. This is good for us. And I remember talking to a supervisor after the meeting. It was, we just need to roll out what has been decided. And I remember walking away, shaking my head. See, you don't have to enslave people and actually make people your slaves to exploit or to treat them like less than they are. But it's amazing how when fear and competition and sometimes pride can creep in and that we can begin to marginalize and treat differently. And I'm especially sensitive to this now that it's been my privilege later on that I have many peers that are small business people. And that's, I think, how this conversation came up. It's, it's tough being on the short end. We need to treat people the way we want to be treated. 
We need to love people the way we want to be loved. In relationships, in business, it's the right thing to do. Because you know what? God pays attention to the cause of the vulnerable, to those who are at risk. That makes sense. We need to each work that out in all of our relationships and our business dealings and other things. God will use our faith and our courage to protect and uplift those who are at risk or are vulnerable. Continuing on, verse 11 through verse 15 goes into another aspect of this demonstrating that God is aligned with the vulnerable. So it says, one day, verse 11, after Moses had grown up, so remember what happened here was that you know, by God's providence and God's kindness, he stirred the heart of Pharaoh's daughter to have compassion on this child and to not just want to have this child die in the river, but you know, perhaps it met a need of hers, whatever. She gave the baby back to his very mother. She may not have known it was his mother. And she got to nurse him, and I don't know how many years that was, and to raise him to at some point. But he lived in his mother's arms, in his mother's household, for probably at least a couple of years, maybe three, maybe four, I don't know. But at some point, when he got to be a bit older, he was brought into the household of Pharaoh and became Pharaoh's daughter's son and grew up there with all the education, with all the benefits, with all the... Again, Egypt was a superpower at this time. So he grows up in the household of the king of Pharaoh. So now, much time has passed, 35 years, whatever. One day, in verse 11, after Moses had grown up, Moses, named such because he was drawn out of the water, he went out to where his own people were and watched. So clearly Moses had some awareness that he was Hebrew by origin, but at some point became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And so, as an older person, he went out to where his people were laboring and were being forced to labor and were being used ruthlessly, and he watched this. And he saw them at their hard labor, and in particular, specifically, he saw an Egyptian, probably an Egyptian slave master, beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. And he was incensed. The scripture doesn't say he was incensed, but his actions indicate he was incensed. This wasn't right. This was unjust. Somebody should do something about this. And he did. It says in verse 12, looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian that was beating on the Hebrew slave, and then he hid his body in the sand. The next day he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one who was in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Ah! Remember? It says that Moses looked this way and that way, thought no one was looking, and then he did something and killed the man, and then hid the body. Apparently it wasn't as hidden as he thought. Interesting that, you know, critiquing the one for hitting the other when, you know, he had just killed an Egyptian. But anyway... Then Moses was afraid, and understandably thought so, and thought, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled and went to live in Midian, region 100, 150 miles away on the Sinai Peninsula, which we'll get a map next time. He went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Moses looked this way, he looked that way, and he killed an Egyptian, which he knew was wrong, and then he tried to hide the body. The takeaway for us is to remember that God sees. God sees us. 
all the time and in all circumstances. And I'm sure that God was pleased that Moses was incensed about the injustice of this Egyptian beating on this Hebrew. I'm sure he was pleased that he saw this as unjust treatment, wrong, something should be done. But God also saw Moses commit murder in his anger and then try and conceal it. And then he also saw Moses standing on a pedestal of self-righteousness. Why are you hitting on this guy? Why are you? And God used the comment from the one Hebrew. What? Who made you judge? You're going to kill us like, like that guy? The takeaway for you and us is that God sees and he works on, he works to refine our violent instincts. Moses' instincts to be incensed, Moses' instincts to want to do something, to alleviate, to changing, was good. But his violent instincts to kill were not. It's in the scriptures for a reason that Moses is like this way, that way. It's important for us to know that God sees and knows all that we do and is committed to working on us, to working with us, to curb our violent instincts, even when at the root of them sometimes there's good impulses. Raise your hand if you're in progress with God. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's kind of how it is, following Jesus and being connected with God in love. It's not based on, yeah, I've got my act off together and, and, you know, God's really lucky to have me on his team and blah, 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 blah. No, we're part of God's family and part of God's commitment of love to us is to help us grow in character and in love. So again, Moses' instincts were good, but he took it too far with the violent side of his nature, using power inappropriately. You know, it's interesting to get really mad about, that guy's using power inappropriately. That Egyptian is beating that Hebrew. He's using power inappropriately. Okay, I'm going to go kill him. God has other ways to accomplish his purposes, which become clearer. So, he flees from Egypt and goes to Midian, 150 miles away on the Sinai Peninsula. Had to be a long, arduous, difficult journey through inhospitable territory. Let's pick it up in verse 16, going on to verse 25. Sorry, that reference is wrong where it says 16 to 15. My mistake. Now a priest of, remember it says he sat down by a well in the region of Midian. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue, and he watered their flocks. And when the girls returned to rule their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian. An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds when they tried to push us aside from the well. An Egyptian rescued us. And then he even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Rule said. Why'd you leave him? Invite him. Invite him back for some of our hospitality and to say thanks. To have something to eat. And so they did. Verse 21 continues that Moses stayed with Rule and his family. Again, he's new to the region, doesn't have a family, doesn't have a job, doesn't have anything. Rule, impressed with the way Moses would stand up for his daughters, it would be very uncharacteristic. You know, it says that Rule's seven daughters went to have the sheep. doesn't mention that any boy, Rule probably didn't have any boys, which would have been kind of a problem. And that's why the shepherds pushed them aside, hey, let us take care of our sheep. You're just women. You'll get when we're done. And Moses stood up for them. And so he stayed with Rule, who, in time, gave his daughter Sipporah to Moses in marriage. And over time, Sipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Not easy to pick up 
on the run, on the lamb, to a region that he's completely unfamiliar with. But God is watching out for him there. During that long period, in verse 23, the king of Egypt that had been pursuing his life, one of the, that last Hyksos king, probably Tutmos III, he died. And the Israelites groaned and continued to groan in their slavery and cried out for help to God. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant, his love promise to them that was made to Abraham and to all his descendants, that they would be numerous as the stars and all the nations of the earth would be blessed through you. God never forgot, just to be clear. But God's people felt like he'd forgotten them because it was hard being a slave in Egypt, very hard. And they felt like God forgot them. As we at times, when life gets really hard and we feel alone or we don't see progress or things aren't getting better or going according to expectation, we can feel like God has forgotten us. And this is a reminder that God's love promise, covenant to us, he never forgets and is always faithful to it. So his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. And as we go forward in the next chapter, we see what God is going to do. Because God just doesn't be concerned and, and then just not do anything. He acts. What's the takeaway for us here as we finish up? God does care. And God does act on behalf of the oppressed and the homeless. Notice what's so positive here is Moses has just trekked a long distance to get to Midian fleeing from the Egyptians and he's sitting there by the well tired and all of a sudden you see these shepherds abusing their power over these women and he stands up for them and says no you're not going to do that these women are first they were here first. That's what they mean by he rescued us. And not only did he water, you know, he stood up for us and made the shepherds wait or get out of there. He watered our flocks. He took care of us. Good instincts. It's a reminder to us that God is aligned with the vulnerable and that we will find God when we also align with the vulnerable and those who are at risk because God cares and God acts on behalf of the oppressed and those who are hopeless or feel like God has forgotten them or is not even there at all and that they're completely and utterly alone in their difficulty. And God wants every person to know that they are never alone in their difficulty and that God will come alongside them and help them through their difficulty. And we get to be part of that as his believers and followers. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we, you, thank you that you are aligned with the vulnerable, that you are aligned with those at risk, that you care and that you see and you want to act. And thank you, Father, that you intend to often act through human beings. And Lord, we thank you for Moses' positive instincts to want to do something. Thank you for the evidence that you want to do something. Thank you for the women that held that powerful Pharaoh at bay by their faith and their courage. Lord, help us to find you as we align with those who are at risk and are not just looking out for ourselves or for number one, but because of your spirit and your love within us, we're willing to take risks. We're willing to have faith. We're willing to stand up for it, to work for it, or on behalf of those who are having a, huff, a rough go of it or who are being treated unfairly. That's what it means to be part of the heart of God. So Lord, would you open our eyes and open our hearts in the different spheres of influence that you've placed us, again, in our areas of relationship and responsibility. Lord, this is where we get to love you with our whole being. This is where we get to love others as we love ourselves, as you have directed and made possible in Jesus. Encourage us and strengthen us. Give us eyes to see. Give us the will and the love to act. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Stand up, and the worship team is going to close us out with a word.